everyone, welcome to the pilot episode of Sandstone Brewing's video series. Today I'm going to go over a little bit about where I've been, how I got to where I am, what I have now, and where I'm going. So sit back, enjoy yourself, have a beer, and let's get this one started. Alright everybody, like I said, uh, you know, first video here from Sandstone Brewing that I've actually gone down and sat and taken the time to edit and format and do all of the production work associated with a real brewing video. Uh, my name is Dempsey Smith. I am a home brewer. I am active duty Navy. And you know this, this is what I do as my hobby, as many of you out there in the world probably do as well. Um, hopefully uh, I can share some of what I've learned over the past, oh goodness, what is it now, 13 years of real brewing on a significant scale and maybe just maybe inspire you or myself to do something new and try out some different things so with that being said as I mentioned before I've been brewing for a little while now right uh, 13 years of serious brewing I got started seriously brewing in college when I realized you didn't have to be 21 to buy beer ingredients I'm sure that's a common thread you know, amongst a lot of people, and uh, it, it worked for me. Um, prior to that though, in the way before times, back when I was in junior high school, my old man got what a lot of people start with, the tried, true, and much lamented Mr. Beer two gallon barrel kit. Now, you know, you're, you're taking what you got in the cupboard as far as pots and pans, doing a really concentrated boil for 15 minutes, not adding any hops, nothing like that. Maybe you're throwing in a ton of table sugar and dumping it into that little two barrel fermenter and just letting it ride for two weeks until you put it in some cheap plastic bottles with some extra sugar and voila, at the end you have a product that is notionally beer. Probably not the best beer in the world, but for a lot of people it's an introduction to the hobby. For me, like I said, I was in junior high. I wasn't drinking this stuff, but I did enjoy cooking. I enjoyed chemistry. My old man did not like cooking. So here I was. I, I have this giant chemistry set and a sponsor to support my activities. And, you know, I brewed for about a year, year and a half with that thing until my dad got tired of my questionable antics of just throwing whatever in the world I wanted into beers. Some of them were bad, some of them were not so bad. Fast forward back into college, right? Like I said, realized I didn't have to be 21 to buy brewing ingredients. So I started making beer in the same way that a lot of people approach the hobby, other than the Mr. Beer type kits. You know, a woefully undersized uh, stainless steel kettle on the kitchen stove, brewing concentrated wort and putting it into buckets and glass carboys. I did that for years, adding kegging, doing this, doing that. Finally upgraded to a, an all-grain system with a converted cooler and lifting giant pots of boiling water to you know, do strikes and mash-outs and all that sort of thing. Probably breaking the rules of my apartment complex with a turkey fryer on the balcony, but that's what it was. So here we are today. Um, you know, I, Currently, I am running a three-vessel Harms electric system that has has done fantastic. Uh, I built it up myself from empty kegs, put all the fittings in myself, did all of the work to make this thing exactly what I thought I wanted in a brewing system. Um, but today, you know, I, I'm looking into the future and I realize I just don't have this space for this old rig, so it's time to upgrade. That being said, let's go to a quick overview on what I was brewing on before, before we get to what I'm going to be brewing on now. Welcome to the brewery. For the past several years, I've been brewing on a three-vessel eHerm system made out of converted kegs, running 30 amps, 240 volt power. Get your standard hot liquor tank, mash tun, and boil kettle back here, and down below the countertop, I got one pump. It looks kind of like a standard one-tier brewing system, but everybody knows you need two pumps to run a one-tier system. That's why I've got my mash tun up on legs. It allows a gravity runoff during the sparging process and saves a little bit of money on having to have pumps. 
There's a little bit of extra finagling during a brew day due to moving around pipes and whatnot, but it's not too bad. And like I said, it'll save you 100, 200 bucks on pumps. So in particular, I've got my hot liquor tank as I mentioned. I've insulated these things with moving blankets that I cut out custom and added grommets to hold in place. Inside of the hot liquor tank, I've got 50 feet of half inch stainless steel tubing, along with a 5,500 watt L ripple element and a temperature probe. To ensure even mixing, I run an aquarium pump bubbling up from the bottom, and that provides a little bit of turbulence to keep uh, stratification from happening in the hot liquor tank. My mash tun over here, I've got an analog temperature gauge on it just so I know where I am in the mash actually control the temperature of the mash through the temperature of the hot liquor tank with my PID controller. This is just a confirmation of what offset I have for a particular brew day. You notice that on this mash tun I'm set up with a bottom drain. I've got a uh, linear flow valve down here so I can fine tune my runoff rate. And the nice thing about a bottom drain mash tun is that there's no real dead space. Um, recently I was able to push 36 pounds of grain and a converted keg mash tun. You know, a lot of other people out there, when you have a domed false bottom or a raised false bottom in one of these setups, you're kind of limited to the 24 to 28 pound range. Works out pretty nice. Over here in the brew kettle, got your standard output valve. I've got a Whirlpool port here from Brew Hardware that's pretty fantastic. Temperature Pro 5500 watt element, and that's about it. On the inside, there's a dip tube that goes down at an angle so the truck can pile up in the middle and I can get clear beer off of it as much as possible. Overall, it's a pretty nice brewing system. You know, I've been using it for several years. I get pretty decent efficiency out of it. Normally, I can run anywhere between 80 and 92% efficiency depending on the beer. That great big beer with the 36 pounds of grain, my most recent Russian Imperial Stout, I actually got 82% efficiency on that bad boy and had no problems with the sparge or the recirculating mash. So the real question here is why in the world would I want to give up a brewery that I know, I understand, and gets fantastic results? The truth is I'm going to be moving in three years. I'm not going to have the same amount of space that I used to have to brew. I'm not going to have a dedicated shed in the backyard with power and plumbing and everything I need. I'm probably going to be relegated to a garage or a basement where the space constraints are much, much tighter. As you can see, three vessel brew system takes a lot of space and I really don't like the idea of tearing down and putting back up the brewery every time I want to brew. Call me lazy, but it's a nice feature to have. So, in pursuit of that, I went out on a limb and uh, started trying out some no sparge batches on this brewery, right? Um, full volume mash, put in whatever grain I need, whatever amount of strike water is going to get me a full boil, and seeing what the efficiency is, seeing how I like the beer that came out of it, and most importantly, whether or not I enjoyed that particular process. Overall, I went from six hour brew days down to approximately four hours on a brew day. It was a huge time saver, a lot less effort, and more importantly, I didn't have to fill up the uh, hot liquor tank with reverse osmosis treated water for a sparge. It saved me quite a bit of water going through the RO system, quite a bit of time collecting water. And ultimately, you know, it's, it's a little more efficient. It's the name of the game, right? It's efficiency. Now that I'm done rambling on about my former glory and brewing days, let's get to the part of the video that everybody probably wants to see. Unboxing the Spike Solo Plus 20 gallon e brew in a bag system. The Spike Solo system comes in two boxes a larger box that is presumably the kettle and the basket, and a smaller box that has everything else in it. I've only got one shot at this. This is my first look, your first look, so let's get started. Opening up the small box, take a look at what we have. 
seems pretty well packaged. Lots of bubble wrap. Smaller components in their own smaller box. And inside of the large bubble wrap packaging, we have what appears to be the control panel. This is quite a swanky unit. Um, from the looks of it, it looks a little bit more put together than uh, my homebrew homemade one. So let's go ahead and get this packaging off. Let's take a look. Try and find the edge of the packaging here so I know where to start. There it is. Alright. So first look at the control panel. You know we've got uh, an auxiliary switch, a pump switch, power switch, and an element switch, and an EBSP200 electric brewing supply PID. Seems pretty simple. It's a little bit bigger than my homebrew setup, but it's really kind of elegant and it looks nice. Over here on the side we have the auxiliary power port, looks like. And on the back we have a port for a temperature probe. We have an element out, power in, and the pump. Shifting back over to this smaller box that came with the control box. Go ahead and open that up. This looks like it. We have all of our cabling. So this one right here is pretty obviously the uh, temperature probe connection. You got two different style plugs, one for each end. It's not how I did it on my homebrew setup, but that does seem to be the conventional wisdom when building an electronic brewing rig. The other cable that comes in here, we have the plug that presumably goes from your standard four prong dryer outlet into the back of the panel with a locking receptacle. I think uh, it's kind of important to note here that hey this locking receptacle is typically what you would find on you know a whole home generator, an inverter generator if you ever wanted to take this out on the road. All right now it's time for the big box. Let's see what's in here. Oddly enough the boxes do not cut we're going to ignore instructions right off the bat and start cutting open all this tape. First thing we have on top is a Spike Solo process guide. Put it on nice glossy paper, pretty heavy. That's fantastic. I'll have to take a look at that later. And we have a Spike Solo product guide showing us our brewing control panel, the kettle, basket, assembly, work, chiller, pump, and hoses. Next to come out of the box is a length of half inch silicon tubing. And the first indication of just how big this whole thing is is this lid for the kettle. I mean, fit myself in here. This thing's fantastic. Packaged up, securely stowed in a cardboard flyer. Go ahead and take this bad boy out. This is uh, significantly nicer than what I've been using on my three vessel setup so far. As we dig further down into this box inside of the grain basket, um, we have two smaller boxes again. First one here, this looks to be the pump assembly from March Pumps. I'm happy to see that this is a March pump. I really love my uh, Blickman Riptide pump head and the fact that I saved the March pump screws whenever I put that on my chugger pump means I can replace the pump head that's installed here with the uh, Riptide head. It's pretty fantastic. Uh, opening up the pump, probably not anything uh, terribly exciting in here. 
from what I can tell, this is supposed to have tri-clover fittings on the pump head. Some people might like that. I don't see the point. Right, so we come in here. Well packaged. I imagine this is what most March pumps look like when they come out of the box. Um, yeah, pretty standard brewery pump here. Center inlet, that's nice. But like I said, this is, uh, is going to go away as soon as I get around to configuring this bad boy. Next up coming out of the box is a heavy box of jingly jangly, presumably, fittings and uh, valves. Getting started opening this bad boy up. Continuing to ignore the instructions not to cut. Because what's homebrew without a little bit of experimentation, risk, and breaking the rules? We're opened up. You can see all of our fittings come in here fairly well packaged. Lots of nice foam paper covering everything so it doesn't bang around. Got a couple tri clamp clamps. Some one and a half inch tri clover to quick disconnect fittings. More tri clamp clamps. More tri clamp clamps. There's going to be a lot of tri clamp here. All right, it looks like we got a pickup tube here. Another clamp. Another pickup tube. Another pickup tube. So, important to note, all these pickup tubes seem to be the same size. They're all angle cut on the end. I'm sure that has a feature. I think it's probably going to get in the way of what I'm wanting to do with uh, the return port in the grain basket, but we'll get to that later. Trigger activated butterfly valves. Nice. a three-piece full diameter ball valve that uh, is a lot bigger than I expected to see coming out of this thing to start with. Um, from the pictures I've seen, this is presumably to control the pump outflow. I really, really prefer the Blickman's linear flow control valve to using a ball valve. Ball valves aren't meant to uh, throttle flow. It's just a fact. All right, so kind of concerned here, right? Temperature probe in a tri-clover. That's a great piece of equipment. I'm curious as to why it was not uh, bagged up and also why there's only two screws in with two empty holes holding this bad boy onto the probe body. Hold bag of black gaskets. All right, so female quick disconnects. I'm curious how the how well these work. I know a lot of people like them. The fact that they're metal and they're going to be moving around hot work kind of bothers me, I think. You know, I feel like there should be some rubberized on it, but we'll see how that works. Even more tri clover to quick connect fittings and some more female quick connects. That's that box. All right, next to come out, the main event, the show you've all been waiting for. Here is the 20 gallon ebrew in a bag spike basket. Let's take a look at this guy. Looks pretty nice. 
We've got rubberized handles. You can see how open that looks to my camera down there on the bottom. It looks a little more closed to me in person, but you know, that's optics for you. It does funny things. Got rubberized handles. They're kind of, you know, they're a little loose on there, but I'm sure that's probably normal. And I can't tell. It kind of looks like the top rim is welded on there, or maybe that's just a forming mark. Either way, looks like a pretty impressive little bit of kit. Um, you'll notice down here where the return line comes in, they've actually, you know, put a, uh, put a recess in there so that this triclover sits out flush, which is pretty nice, I presume. Digging further into the box, we come down here, and here's another power cable. So right off the bat, look at that. Why in the world is that thing separated? I'm sure it'll push back in. It just needs a little bit of work. But that's kind of annoying on a, you know, on a premium product. Anyways, this is obviously to uh, hook up to your heating element. You just have to finagle that a little bit, and I'll probably get her back where I want it to be. Digging further down into the box, and here we are on this 20 gallon brew cow. I have never had such a big brewing vessel. My 15 gallon uh, converted keg, it's pretty nice. It's a lot taller, it's a lot more slender. This guy is wide and deep and huge, but it's the only one I need, so that uh, this should work out for me. Um, one thing to note in shipping, this port over here punched through the edge of the box. I'm gonna to have to take a look and make sure that nothing's dented in here and everything still fits right. So we'll go ahead and pull this guy out. It's a pretty standard kettle as far as 20 gallon kettles go. Um, in here, I don't know if you can see it. Oh, if I turn it like this, you can see it maybe. We got volume markings. You know, does away with uh, having to have a sight glass. Notice that the handles are fore and aft, not side to side. You have one port over here, one port over here, presumably for either your element or your temperature probe, however you want to set it up. And then you have what's a return port up here for a whirlpool because it's positioned higher, and the uh, output over here because it's positioned lower. Down inside the bottom, there's a recess. It'll be a nice place for trub to collect and all that sort of stuff. It'll be curious to see just how much uh, you know lost volume that's going to equate to whenever I do a trial run on this system. The very last thing that's coming out of this box is obviously the heating element. So I've been using Ripple Elements for quite a long time. Um, some of the problems I've had with these is the blades on the end don't get good connection with your cables and they end up overheating and melting your connectors. Um, we'll see how well this one lasts and if I have any problems. Durnord makes a nice one that has a enclosure on the back where you actually hook up wires with a cable coming out to a plug that's separate from the vessel. Hopefully since this looks a little different and it looks like it's manufactured a little different you got some rtv sealing in there and everything feels pretty well put together i won't have that problem all right everything is taken out of the box so now it's time for me to go ahead and kind of put it together and on the shelf so that we can uh, take a look at how it looks on the brewery All right, so here we have it notionally all put together. Um, nice controller over here. Yeah, it comes with a pump. I don't particularly like this great big pile of stuff hanging around the ball valve. It's clunky, it's clumsy, it's harder to clean. I will probably be taking the uh, Riptide pump head that I have on my chugger pump motor and putting it on here. 
I like the setup better um, with the quick connect NPT fittings that I'm using. It's not a problem to take those off if I ever need to. Plus, it's a whole lot easier to get the pump head off and access the impeller so you can clean it. With that being said, um, moving on to having this thing connected. They supply approximately 10 feet of half inch silicon tubing that is not cut to any particular length. Um, the way that I want my setup put together here, uh, I needed two 48 inch or four foot lengths for the um, pickup and return lines and that leaves me two feet for the research over there. Notionally, I would pro I'm probably going to try and figure out some way to hook up the lock line there because um, that's just how I prefer it, but for now uh, I'm sure this will work. Um, concerns and comments on this uh, from putting it together. For one thing, you know, some of the screen printing on the controller is a little scratched. I'm not too worried about that. I can read it. Um, I'm not, it's not going to win any beauty contest because that's not what I'm looking for it to do. Some of the uh, laser etching here is a little dull in spots. Again, not a big deal. The, the big concern I had was back here on the temperature probe. Um, as I was showing in the unboxing portion of this video, it was missing two screws and one of the two that it had was loose. Um, luckily I had the probes from my old setup that I can go ahead and go in there. I stole those and put it on, tightened them down, got it all put together like it was supposed to. We'll see uh, if Spike can get me a couple extra of those screws out so that I can fix the old system whenever I go to sell it. And uh, the other thing with the temperature probe, the included black triclover gaskets don't fit the triclover fitting of the probe. They're a little too big. Couldn't get it to work. Luckily, I had an extra one sitting around from my other stuff, and that seemed to work okay. So something to consider. Maybe you'll run into the same problem I had. I kind of doubt it, but we'll see what happens. Um, going on to the lid, a nice solid lid. Unlike the preview units that were out there, this one does in fact sit nice and flush. Big bonus there. And as you can see, you can hang the lid on the handles, which is really handy. Coming over here to the kettle itself, something that I was really looking forward to is where the, you know, the, the volumes work out to. There's enough space up here to go ahead and install some sort of steam condenser on the side of the kettle. You don't necessarily need to buy the steam condensing lid from Spike. Um, so Brewer's Hardware or Brew Hardware has their Steam Slayer and that's probably what I'll go ahead and end up installing on this when the time comes. But for now, uh, I'll go without just knowing that I actually have that capability whereas on my Kegel system, I didn't have the room. So uh, Valves, really nice trigger activated butterfly valves. You can close them in either direction or wide open, which is pretty fantastic. And the quick disconnects are fairly large board. Um, really got to stretch that tubing over the barbs. I was concerned about not having any hose clamps for them, but I think they'll do okay. And we'll just have to see how the heat affects it. So, next thing to take a look at here um, will be how this fits inside of my roof with the mash tun lift up. Alright, so here we have the uh, grain basket in its up configuration allowing the uh, mash to drain out into the brewing kettle. Um, I was kind of worried it would be too tall for my setup but it looks like I've got enough room up there that I can mount a hoist up in the, the rafters here and be able to use that as it sits on my bench. That's nice. Overall the height of the kettle is just about perfect for sitting on a regular countertop high bench. All your valves will be in the right place and you'll be able to access the inside of the kettle very neatly. All right, here we are. Everything got put together, and the first thing I did was to go ahead and put in 14 gallons of water in there, about the same volume of water I would use for a lower ABV no sparge batch. And follow the auto-tuning instructions that are provided with the system. Pretty simple. Read them, press a few buttons, set a temperature, and walk away for an hour or two while it learns what in the world it needs to be doing. When I came back out here, um, I took it from the set value of 154, typical mash temperature, and put the set value to 160. 
ramped up really quick, hit it dead on the numbers. Very, very happy with this controller. So overall, how do I feel about the spike clearing system that I got? You know, I'm happy with it. There's a couple quality control issues that I'm sure Spike is going to take care of um, with the Temperature uh, Pro, and it's not that big of a deal. I'm excited to brew with it. It's probably going to be a couple weeks before my fermenter is open, and I'm ready to go ahead and put something through it. First batch is going to be a light American lager, mostly because I'm starting a sh series of lager brews, and I want to brew up a bunch of yeast the easy way. That being said, if there's something I could change about the system just from the little bit that I've used it and played with it so far today, I've got two gripes that will be real simple fixes. Whether Spike wants to start putting them in the kit or or not, you know, these are things that I think would help. So first thing, I don't like moving hoses with unconstrained liquid in them. It's hot. It's dangerous. It's not safe. But what I was doing on my previous system to alleviate that was using these fun little plastic clips. I put them on each end that I moved around hoses on, and that way whenever I move, whenever I move the hoses, I just clamp down, nothing's coming out of that. Much safer, much easier, less chance of uh, you know getting yourself hurt or spilling a lot of hot, sticky work all over the place. Two of these bad boys is all you need for this system. Easy day. The other gripe I have, and maybe that's not quite a uh, quick fix for Spike. Um, looking at these connections coming straight out of the fittings, you're putting strain on these hoses. It doesn't appear to be too much of a problem. I'm not getting much kinking a little bit down here. But if these quick connects had 90 degree bends, like the quick connects I was using on my previous system, these are thread on NPT quick connects, then as the hoses hung, you know, they could be stress relieved already because of the bend and the fitting. I think that'd be fantastic on those quick, quick connects. It's a small change. Somebody needs to make these fittings. They'll make it killing. So, overall, do I like the system? Yes. Are there problems? Yeah, a couple quality control issues, a couple things that might could be improved. But from running a test run with water, putting it together, fit, form, function, all of those good things. I'm satisfied and I'm happy with this brewery. It's uh, significantly smaller, it's significantly simpler, and I even have a small idea of how I might be able to do a Pargao batch with a basket system. So, thanks for sticking with me through the video. Very much appreciate it. Hope you tune in for the next video, which will most likely be the first brew day on my Spike Solo system.